Welcome back aboard Mark Pryor for the second part of our series aboard this hard-working little ship as she punches into the ebb as it streams northwards along the Essex coast. The mate is now at the helm while the skipper Peter Buck is below and getting some sleep before taking over the ship at South End for the run up the Thames. We left Fingringho at the top of the tide, carrying the flow down the river cone till reaching the sea. Then we headed out, crossing the Wallet and the Spitway, and turning south at the Whittier Boy to sail down Middle Deep towards the Thames. It's an interesting view from the wheelhouse aboard the Mark Pryor because you associate, or I associate, this piece of water really with the great days of barges and in those dim and distant days that I can kind of vaguely remember you would see quite a lot of shipping travelling from the east coast ports up to the Thames but now there's really nothing here at all we've seen I guess five or six commercial fishing boats, small fishing boats. We've seen three or four anglers out drowning a few worms and hopefully catching a few things. But that's all we've seen. The only commercial vessel we've seen within any sort of easy distance is ourselves. So Mark Pryor is uh, today's sole survivor of the inshore shipping industry, the coastal shipping industry of the UK that we can see. Hopefully we'll see a bit more interest when we get a bit closer to the Thames and a bit closer to South End, but I don't think we're going to see a lot of ships of this kind. To be honest, although the weather today is really beautiful, I'd have been glad if it had been a bit bumpier, because, believe me, it isn't always like this here, especially in the winter. A wind blowing hard from the northeast, against the ebb tide flowing north, and you'll get some short, steep and nasty seas that will stop a small boat and slow Mark Pryor down too. The tide is also a big influence in the ship's sailing routine. Most small boat and coastal commercial skippers would naturally sail with the tide, but heading towards London we are against it for four or five hours. That's because we have to leave fingering how at the top of the tide, when there's enough water to get out of the berth safely, and then we have to arrive at the Deptford Creek Wharf well before high water, around half flood. That gives us the rest of the rising tide to discharge the cargo, and then we leave at high water on the Thames to carry the tide all the way down the river and north up the Essex coast. That means we'll arrive at the berth back home as the tide is rising, with two or three hours to load, and then we sail again at high water to continue the daily cycle. It really is all go for Mark and her two-man crew. As we get closer to the main channel of the River Thames, we start to see more ships. 
This very North Stream is heading out at around 18 knots and she is followed by a couple of other row rows, product tankers and dredges. Eventually we come abeam of South End Pier and the skipper takes over. He and Fraggles take off the hatch sheet to dry out the boards and then it's a mug of tea and a nutter. He's been sailing these waters for well over 40 years and even in that time many things have changed on the river. It's relatively quiet isn't it? But it must have been much much busier when you first went to sea. Well, Chris, it's to be honest, somebody my age going up and down the east coast now, it's very sad. It's actually, you know, I, I call it sad because, um, you know, we're, obviously we're all remembering the yes, yesteryear. Just like, for example, where we are now, the Chapman, we're just passing the Chapman Anchorage now on our way into the Thames. Just the Chapman Anchorage in itself, you used to have sometimes 10 to 15 ships all anchored here. This used to be the explosive anchorage where they used to load explosives. Um, obviously the explosives came from Woolwich Arsenal, so that kept all the barges busy. A lot of crescent shipping barges were doing it. Um, all sorts of barges bringing the explosives down and transshipping. The ships used to load with their own gear, their own masts and derricks here in the Chapman Anchorage. And obviously just that movement alone used to generate all sorts of other, other stuff with it. You had crews joining, the ships needed fuel, so you had bunker barges running in and out, um, food, stores. It was just a hive of activity and this is just where we are now. As you go further up river, as you'll see, the wharves are all empty now and falling apart, the ones that haven't already been demolished. Just over there to the south of us, the Medway entrance, Garrison Point. You know, I used to, in the early 70s, used to run up there regularly. You know, we used to have regular runs in there from Brussels, the ships I were on, Spring Last, etc., etc., which a lot of you will probably remember. Bell Sovi, bringing the steel coils in from Brussels and that sort of thing. You'd have to queue at Garrison Point, lay there at anchor, to enable you to get a berth up the Medway, up at Limehouse, Limehouse Wharf. Or Honey's Wharf. One of ETS, Mark Pryor, just passed the Chapman boy in the boat. Mark Pryor, this is one of ETS, passed the Chapman boy in the boat. In part three, we'll be seeing many of our capital's nautical landmarks as we carry on up the Thames. Then we'll be turning into Deptford Creek to offload. See you soon.